Oh, yes, please. Yep. Cool, cool. Yeah, we'll start the live on Facebook. And like I say, every week, the first two minutes is always me just talking it out to myself out in Facebook land. No, not share on my Nice, name. nice. Share to our page. All right. And are we just let me know when we're good to go? Yeah, we we should be good to go. So thank you, everyone. Um, this is Kiyomi and Devon. Give a little shout out. Hey, Devon. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> with Center of Life and the Family and Community Engagement team here with you once again this week. We are really excited to bring the Financial Empowerment Center here. We have Alicia, and she's going to be talking with us about understanding credit, kind of how to demystify that and how we can you know, learn about how to better our credit and really what that means. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to go ahead and hand it over to Alicia. All right. Well, yeah, I'm excited to be here as well. And um, as Kiyomi, right? You're yes. Good. Cool. Um, said, yeah, my name is Alicia. I'm one of the four financial empowerment center counselors at the Pittsburgh FEC. Um, and yeah, we're here to talk about credit. I know this is the final one in the series. And this is something we talk about a lot at the FEC because a lot of people are interested in improving their credit, especially working towards some big goals like home ownership or getting a car, that sort of thing. So we're going to talk about, um, yeah, what that is and what you need to do to get a good credit score and also to kind of think about credit um, holistically, both by itself, but also as part of your bigger financial picture. So kind of as a first question, what is credit? Anybody have any ideas? Uh, I know there's just a few of us in here, so if anyone has a thought on that. Um, borrowing monies that you don't really have. This is true. <laughs> and that can get you into trouble. But yeah, like as part of that idea, really it is goods or services, you're 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 getting it now, but you're actually going to be paying for it later. So that's it, kind of that borrowing money that you don't have right now. So when you spend with your credit card, you're not actually paying for, let's say, gas. You're not paying for it in the moment. The credit card company is paying for it, and then they put it on your credit card bill, and then you pay that later. And so that's really what credit is. It's extending money to you so you can purchase something in the moment but you're not gonna pay for it right away. And this is where, like you can do that obviously with everyday things on a credit card, but really what you want credit for is to pay for a big thing that's a big asset for you, like your education, a car, your home, that you can't afford to pay it in cash for it because it's just too much money. But you know, like that's gonna be a good asset. Like even, you know, a car, that can really open up your life. Even if you don't have the money to pay for the full car all at once, it makes sense to like get that loan because maybe it'll allow you to get a better paying job or with a house, it allows you to like gain wealth and be able to pass that wealth on to your children. So credit is a scary thing and can be used unwisely, but ultimately it's also a good thing because it does open up opportunities to lots of people who might not have access to the liquid funds to get something in the moment especially when we're thinking of bigger purchases like that car, that education, or that home. All right, and then also we want to talk about things I like um, are the five C's of credit, which include character. This, this is really the meat and potatoes of your credit score is showing your character. How good are you at paying back what you owe? That's what the character is. The next thing, also really important, but I think people tend to forget about, myself included, is capacity. How much debt can you afford? How much can you afford to pay back? This is something as you're looking at, you know, home ownership, what usually comes up is your debt to income ratio. We're not going to talk about that too much today, but it is a really important thing because uh, capacity is how much house can you afford? And that's where your income comes into play, which also relates to capital. How much money do you have access to both as income, which relates to that capacity and how much you can pay, 
but also like how much can you put down, pay towards a big purchase, um, and then you finance the rest, like a down payment on a house or a car which also relates to this thing called collateral. So collateral is uh, something that can be repossessed if you default on the loan. And that's when we talk about secured debts, like your house or car. Those are things that physical piece of property is actually collateral that the lender can take back from you if you stop making payments and no longer abide by the contract you were on. And then the last C of credit is the conditions, the terms of the loan, like the, the language that you are agreeing to. Because when you enter into a credit agreement, that's a contractual agreement. Same like if, when you enter into a banking relationship, you're entering into a legal contract with that bank. Same with a, uh, a loan. Um, conditions include what's the interest rate? What's the term? Um, are there any things like prepayment penalties, if you pay it off too, too soon. Really, um, you want a loan that doesn't have any prepayment penalties because if you can pay off a loan soon, you end up saving on interest, you get more money in your budget. But sometimes less savory loans have conditions where they make sure they get all of their interest and maybe then some. So there might be a prepayment penalty if you pay off the loan too soon. So this conditions is also important because it's really knowing what you get yourself into before you sign on the dotted line. All right, so now we have a couple of true or false questions. This first one is, do you need to carry a balance on your credit card to build and or maintain credit? Any answers there? So I wanna say, oh, Miss Danielle says false. I wanna say false, although I have heard from people that you don't wanna leave it at zero balance. So that'd be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yes, so the correct answer is false. So yes, this is kind of a tricky one and is a little bit of a pervasive myth. My colleague Kristen gets really frustrated with it, as do I, um, because carrying a balance just means you're gonna be end up um, paying more in interest because you're not paying off that full amount every month. And I'm a little intrigued by what you mentioned about you've heard that it, you don't wanna leave it at zero, Actually, that is sometimes not true um, because so regarding debt to income ratio, you actually want to have it at zero because you want your debt to income ratio to be as low as possible. And the way debt to income ratio is calculated is they add up all of your monthly debt obligations, which is in, includes those minimum monthly payments on credit cards. And then they compare that to your monthly gross income. And that's where they get the debt to income ratio. So you can actually give yourself a better debt to income ratio if you have zero on your credit card and actually pay it ahead of time before the statement is cut. Um, it's a little bit trickier when you are first setting out and building credit because you wanna show that you're using that credit and you actually don't need to carry a balance. And in that case, when you are a newer consumer, maybe just starting out with a credit card, uh, it's good to make sure you get a statement that is created. And that's where be, that's where you'll get, it won't be zero because you'll have a bill and it might be like, you owe us $30 and then you pay that off and you don't owe anything. The way credit is still reported to the credit bureaus is monthly, maybe semi-monthly, but it's not automatic. The credit bureau reporting system is still pretty antiquated. They basically just put put on the credit or on the credit report, your monthly statement. Um, so, you know, it's once a month because this system is based in back in the day when we first had plastic and they had those like cha-ching things that made a copy of the, the raised numbers and you would just spend all month and you get a bill in the mail, you'd write a personal check, send it back in the mail. It's designed for that time. The fact that we can pay everything online and pay early and know exactly what our balance is the credit reporting system is not up to speed there yet. So um, yeah, it's kind of, you don't actually need to carry a balance. You can always get a statement created and have a bill. That's really good, especially for people who are working on building their credit or rebuilding to show that they're using their card. But after that, you especially if you're working towards like a big purchase, like a home, you might act, it might actually be worthwhile to pay everything off immediately in order to give yourself a really good debt to income ratio and qualify for the largest amount of 
possible. So this is a very pervasive myth and it is false. And really like you just end up like paying more in interest if you carry a balance and also end up having a crummy debt to income ratio, which will then affect how much you qualify for in a loan. All right, next one. You only have one credit score, true or false? Oh, I know this. False. <laughs> You're like, I got this. I got this one. <laughs> nice, nice. Let's see. All right, okay. Got some other false ones here. Yes, this is also false. So this one is also pretty sneaky because yeah, different lenders, they use different versions and weights of your credit score. There are 10 plus versions of the FICO score, like there are like 10 that have been developed, but there's actually thousands of different scoring models because there's all these sub ones. And also something that's really important to think about because we get a lot of, a lot of clients at the FEC that are like, well, why is my score different here than what you tell me? And really it's because we are giving you your FICO 8 score, which is the most common, but it's the lender's prerogative to choose what scoring model they use. So they might use the specific FICO auto lending score, which will be different than your FICO 8 score, which is different than your FICO 9 score, which is different than your Vantage 3.0 score. And there's just like a ton of different things. Um, that, yeah, there's just so many permutations of that credit score, and it really is up to the lender to decide which score they use, which does make it hard. We can kind of give you like a prediction, like your FICO 8 score is 750. That's great, but it's probably going to look different when it's pulled at the car dealership, depending on what score they're using. And we can't, we can't really tell them, you need to pull my FICO 8 score because that's not your responsibility as a consumer they get to do whatever they want as that lender. All right. So here's just a little rundown of like why credit scores are important. Like a good credit history, you know, that's what you need to like qualify for an apartment. I know a lot of my clients are working on like, oh, I can't, no one will rent to me because I need to work on my credit score. Uh, get a good deal on insurance or make sure it's affordable. Not have to pay deposits for your utilities, you know, having a good credit score literally saves you money. Um, get a credit card, you know, potentially get a job and pass job clearances and ultimately have access to that bigger and better credit in the future. That's why building credit when you're younger, starting out by using a credit card wisely, um, you know, getting student loans and managing them well, that will help you have access to bigger and better credit like a mortgage in the future. And how do you get a better credit score? It is the information on your credit report, which we do have access to. That is what is used in the calculation of those scores. Uh, and we have, we know like the basic gist of how they're calculated, but the actual algorithms are proprietary. So we're not gonna know, oh, if I do this, my credit score will go up exactly this much because again, that information is all owned by um, the, Fair Isaac Co. Company, which is FICO, and the company that owns the Vantage scores. Uh, so we can know some general rules, but I always say to my clients, like, I don't know, we don't know exactly how much your scores will go up. And also things that like Credit Karma, I know, does some score prediction. It's always with a grain of salt. You know, they are using some math they have gained from the credit system, but it could still be, it could still go either way. You know, there's no guarantee that the score that Credit Karma predicts you'll get if you pay off X amount on this credit card is actually what's going to happen. It's just highly likely. And that's why I think they give you like a percentage. We expect this to happen like 75% of the time if you do this. But um, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of intellectual property and math involved. So we can know some of the basic rules, but as far as exact scores, that is very much don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. All right. So another key thing with credit is that, especially when you have a loan, there's that interest rate. And so credit will cost you. Um, so how about you're looking at, you need a car and you're gonna borrow $5,000 in a loan for this car loan. And so we have a little breakdown here of how much that interest will be 
depending on what your interest rate is. So like if it's a 5% interest rate, you're going to pay $527 over 48 months. Four-year car loan is actually a really good, a good, um, good amount to look for. Um, but, you know, as it goes up, it gets doubled, like, or even more than that, like you're paying over a thousand dollars. And if you have to pay 25% over four years, you're going to be paying another $3,000, almost $8,000 total for that $5,000 car, which is why you want a good credit score. So you can qualify for a good interest rate, especially when you have to borrow money. The lender doesn't want to give that money for free. So they're going to ask for a little bit back as interest. All right. Um, another big thing with credit, there are two major credit categories. So we have secured credit and unsecured credit. So secured credit, like I mentioned um, when we were talking about the five C's of credit, secured credit is backed by a collateral, like a mortgage, a car loan. Those are backed by that physical property. That's why if you default on your car loan, your car can get repossessed. If you foreclose, your, your house is taken back by the lender. Unsecured debt is debt that isn't backed by, a coll by collateral. That's credit card debt, personal loans, student loans. There's no physical object that a lender can take back if you default on those loans. It will definitely affect your credit because it's gonna affect that character part of the five C's of credit uh, because you're not showing that you are good at paying back your debts. But if something happens and you're like, okay, I can't, I gotta triage my budget, um, it's better to stop paying some of these unsecured debts than these secured debts, especially if these secured debts are like the place where you live, the car you take to work, you wanna make sure those stay current. All right, another big thing with credit is the annual percentage rate, that, that bad interest rate, as we say. Um, and there's two types, we got fixed, does not change, is always going to be 10% for the life of the loan. This is more common, with uh, installment credit, which are gonna be like your student loans, your car loans, your mortgage. Installment means it's set for a period of time. Like you get that car loan, 48 months, four years. You're gonna pay the same amount every month for four years and then you pay it off. And that is the end of that trade line. Variable rate can go up and down and is usually tied to the prevailing rate. So this is where your credit cards come in. And they usually have those higher interest rates and they will go up and down. Um, and, but they will have to notify you depending on that. And that is also re reflected, it goes up and down both based on the prevailing rate, but also your credit. So as you do better and get a better credit score, you might get a lower uh, variable interest rate. And another key thing here is to talk about revolving trade lines. So that will be your credit cards. They're called revolving because unlike an installment loan where you borrow $5,000, it pays for a car and it just goes down over time, a revolving credit, like a credit card, it's you get a credit limit and you can borrow up to that amount and then you pay it down, borrow up, pay down, borrow up, pay down. And it doesn't have to be the full amount. Uh, ideally you won't carry a balance, but it, it's called a revolving debt because it isn't going down. It can go up and down and you pay it off every month. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about the five major factors for how you build and maintain a credit score. So the first one, this most important one, 35%, is your payment history. Do you pay on time? And this is where it's really important to um, pay on time, pay at least the minimum balance on time um, because you want to maintain that good credit history. Ideally for like something like a revolving debt, like a credit card, you want to pay off that full balance, um, you know, before the statement, uh, before the due date, because that's how you avoid any interest charges. But if you at least pay the minimum, which is something to do, you know, if you're experiencing an income change or the like, um, you, that's how you maintain that good credit score. And this is the top factor. Next thing is um, the 30% rule. This is the credit utilization rule specific to revolving accounts because those are the ones that can go up and down. Uh, do you have high balances on your credit cards or do you max out 
your limit. So regarding this utilization rule, does anyone know um, what you're supposed to keep your credit card utilization under in order to maintain a good score? So this would be like how much you want to charge on a card based on what the full credit limit is. Is it below the 30 or 20%? It is, it's below 30, yeah. So this is kind of a nice mnemonic. It counts for 30% of your FICO score and you wanna keep it below 30. And this is something where um, I think maybe what you mentioned earlier about, I don't wanna keep it at zero. It's actually, your score will go up the closer you are to zero. So if you like keep your credit utilization at like 6%, that's actually where I think Experian has found like people get the best credit score. But if you have something like uh, a credit card with a $300 limit, 30% is 90 bucks, 6% is like $18. It is hard to, um, you know, just spend $18 on a card if you have, like if you're, you know, using it to pay a $35 monthly bill or the like. But as your credit limit goes up, which you earn by having a good credit history, then that 6% becomes a bigger number and is easier to maintain. So like say you no longer have um, a $300 limit, you have a $1,000 limit. That 6% has went from 18 to 60. Like now you can definitely cover that $35 bill with while maintaining that 6%. All right, next thing is uh, overall credit history. Like how long is your credit history? Um, and this is something I think I see with a lot of clients, like maybe you made mistakes in the past. So you don't have, you have some old cards, but they were closed because you stopped making payments or life happened, all of that. So maybe your credit history is shorter. Unfortunately, we can't really go back in time and you know open a card when you were 18, um, but you can start working really well today with the credit you have today make sure you maintain that paying on time and keeping that utilization low, especially on something like a revolving card because a revolving account, a credit card can stay open for decades. Whereas with an installment loan, those are always gonna be paid off in X number of years. Like, and that's a good thing. Uh, I, that's a, another thing people get concerned. Your credit score will drop when you pay off um, an installment loan. However, it's nice um, to, to like have that paid off um, because you get more money in your budget. Also, you know what, you own that car outright. You'll get that car title and it's exciting. So a lot of my clients are like, I don't wanna pay this off because I know it's gonna lower my credit score, but it's only gonna lower your credit score temporarily. And also your credit score doesn't care about the other parts of your budget, like saving or having more money. Uh, so that's something where I talk about like, we're going to think about credit holistically, both with itself, but as part of your bigger financial picture. Uh, credit doesn't care about saving. Saving is really important. So it is okay to pay off that installment loan and celebrate paying it off and having more money in your budget to save. That's a good thing. Uh, next thing is what type of credit do you have? You want to have a mix. You want to have like some installment loans, some revolving amounts, uh, revolving accounts, that sort of thing. It's good to have a mix. However, another caveat here, you don't want to just take out an installment loan to have a good mix of credit is why are you paying interest on something just to just to keep your credit up? That's something I want to like people to step back from like your credit score is not everything. That's a, a big thing too. I think we get really hung up on like, I need to have a good score, but why do you need a good score? Like think about, think about why you're doing certain things and if it's worth it. And also, like I said, when we were discussing the five C's of credit, credit score is only one part of it. The other factor is capacity. Like even if you have a great credit score, I'll use myself for this example. I had an over 800 credit score, was looking to refinance my, uh, private student loan so it was about $7,700. I was really excited. I was gonna, I'm going to pay it down sooner than I expected. Super excited. I couldn't get a loan, a refi loan without a cosigner. And the reason was my debt to income ratio was not good. And they were like, oh, you have a good credit score, but 
eh, we don't want to like extend this risk to you without having a co-signer. And it was just really frustrating because I was like, wait, I like have a great credit score. Why won't, why won't you like give me this thing? Because there are other factors and debt to income ratio is the big one that I think we don't talk about enough. And it's especially important when we're talking about mortgages because that's, you know, mortgage, like if you have a great credit score, that's what gives you a good interest rate. However, um, your debt to income ratio, that's what determines how much mortgage you qualify for and therefore how much house you can afford. All right. And then the last, like, what's your recent credit inquiries like? Um, have you opened any new cards? Have you been like looking credit hungry and applying for cards at every store at the waterfront? That is not something you want to do because every time you have a hard inquiry, you apply for a new type of credit, especially if it's completely separate your score is going to drop. And that is a preventative measure. Like that is something if your identity was stolen, people are going to try to open a bunch of cards in your name. So it's actually a good thing. Like you want your credit to get locked down if um, too many inquiries are on there. But that's also something you can know, like don't make a ton of inquiries. Um, personally, if you're working on maintaining a good credit score, what's nice about this, and this only is with the newer credit scoring models, which I think is like the FICO eight and higher. So the more common ones um, is that if you make multiple inquiries in the same category, those, and they're in the same, like the close enough period of time, which is anywhere from, I think it's two weeks with the Vantage scores to 45 days with the FICO scores, it only counts as one inquiry. And I mean, they're in the same category if you are looking at a car loan because they know, lend, or the credit bureaus realize people wanted to shop around for rates. So yeah, they're not gonna take the first car loan offer they get. They're gonna check with their bank and with the dealership and maybe with another dealership if you're shopping around. And so the credit bureaus and the FICO scores decided, okay, we don't wanna, don't want people to have to suffer for just doing a good consumer practice of shopping around for rates. So now, there are called inquiry groupings, but it's not for things like credit cards because those can be completely separate accounts. It's much more for car loans and mortgages, which allow you to have some multiple inquiries but not have your credit score drop too significantly because they realize like, no, this is a good practice to find the best rate for you as a consumer. All right, and this, yeah, kind of going into this inquiry, um, like a hard inquiry is when you apply for credit, like, mortgage, credit card, that sort of stuff. And then a soft inquiry is just when you're looking at your credit. So this is something we'll talk about in a little bit. Like if you are just looking at your credit report on annualcreditreport.com, that's a soft inquiry. If you go to the FEC and I pull your credit report, that's a soft inquiry because it's not actually us applying for a loan or anything like that. It's just looking at your credit report. So it's not gonna negatively impact your score. And this little checkbox, like, yeah, avoid trying to open multiple new accounts in those separate categories. Like don't open a bunch of store credit cards all on the same day uh, in a short time period because that's where your score is going to tank. All right. And so this is a key thing talking about what we're talking about are like two different things. We got your credit score and your credit report. Your credit score is what is developed from the information on your credit report. So uh, the big thing that we encourage people to do, which I think is, yeah, this next one, is pull your, um, your credit reports at least once a year from the three major bureaus, which are Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. You wanna do that at least once a year. Uh, the law is currently written that you can obtain one free copy of your credit report. Uh, every 12 months from each of the three bureaus. So it's good to get into a habit of doing one each four, four months. However, if you haven't done it in a while or you've never done it, which was just like me when I started this job, you can actually get your full credit reports free weekly until the end of next April due to COVID. Uh, so that is a nice um, extension right now. And when we say credit report, again, you're not going to get your credit score for free here. You're just going to get the information on your credit report. But it's still, this is very important information because you want to make sure that information is correct because that's the information that the credit bureaus use 
to give you your credit score. So it's good to make sure there's no fraudulent activity. Um, all the account information looks correct. There's no like weird collections accounts that you didn't know about. Like maybe something happened like a medical bill didn't arrive or it went to the wrong address. And so now it went into collections. You wanna get those things handled as soon as possible. Uh, so that's why it's good to like check your credit reports, you know, get into that uh, once every four month cycle. You can pull all three right now because of the free weekly thing. Um, but it is important to also only go to annualcreditreport.com. This is the only one that is like free, free. There's lots of um, pretenders out there and scammers. So this is the one you wanna go to. All right. And, and all of this, like, like kind of talking about credit, we also wanna talk about how do you work on building credit safely and smartly? So two big things we really like, and I really, really like secured credit cards. Um, there are things like credit building loans, um, which they are good products. It's kind of like, it's, a, it's almost like a reverse loan because what you do is you open a credit building loan and you pay monthly, but instead of getting the lump sum at the beginning, like with a traditional loan, you'll get it at the end. You're essentially paying into a savings account and then you get it in 12 months, 24 months whatever the term is. Um, however, like you could also be saving that money regularly. It won't be credit reported, but you could do that. But it does have the, the downside of being like any installment loan. It's got a, it's, you know, it's got a timeline. It's got a life cycle. It's only going to be around for 12 months or 24 months, whatever. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be something to keep like a long and healthy credit history. Opening a secured credit card that will eventually graduate into a regular credit card or using a secured credit card for six to 12 months and then being able to open a regular credit card, that's the thing where you can get a really long and healthy credit history and get really started on the right path. Also, if we got parents in the audience, which I expect we do, um, opening a credit card, even while your kids are young and using that credit card really smartly, when they are late teens, you can add them as authorized users on your credit card. They don't even have to actually use the card to get the benefit of having a long and healthy credit history that you have. Um, I know for me, my mom added me as an authorized user when I was in college and she sent me a card. There were times when I did not use that card wisely. Um, and then when I was older, I kept losing it. So she just like refused to send me the card. Um, but I still get the benefit of being an authorized user on that card, even though I haven't used my card in years. I still get the benefit of her using it well, and it was opened when I was 12. So I get six extra years to my credit history from having being an authorized user. So that's something you can think about. Not only would you be opening a credit card for yourself and building your own credit, but also hopefully getting your kids off on the right foot. Um, with secured credit cards, um, they kind of, they float in this in-between world of secured and unsecured debt. They're backed by a security deposit. So it's usually, you have to start with 200 to $300. And that money is left in a savings account. You can't touch it while you have the secured credit card. Um, but it's like that insurance policy, like a security deposit when you rent an apartment. Like if you charge up the card and then never pay it, the, the bank just seizes that savings account and they don't, there's no skin off their nose. They're not really out of luck. You know, they're just like, whatever, we had the savings account, this person left. Um, and it's something that's available for more risky consumers. Risk, it feels weird to say risky, but from a lender's perspective, someone with no credit or poor credit history is more risky because they don't have that character that shows they're uh, like a good, have the responsibility of paying back their debts. So this is like a nice training wheel option uh, for building credit. And then for most secured credit cards, after you've like proven yourself worthy, abided by the terms and conditions of that credit card, like pay it off, at least pay the monthly um, payment each month, that sort of thing. Um, you can have your card be graduated to an unsecured credit card. So say, you start with a card with a $200 limit. And then after eight months of use, the card company is like, oh, you did really well. Um, we're going to give you a $1,500 limit and here's your $200 back. So that savings account is released back to you. So that is like 
great thing with secured credit card because then, you know, if that credit card graduates to an unsecured credit card, you can just have that card open indefinitely. And that will be a great way to have a good long credit history. Another thing is gonna be um, put a bill in your name, um, like, or, you know, pay something automatically regularly with a bank account or even on a credit card, like your cell phone bill, your streaming services, that sort of thing. Um, this is a way to like kind of formalize things that are usually not credit reported through a program called Experian Boost. And that's the main way to do it right now. Um, so it's only reported to Experian, but I think there are developments for this to be used in Equifax and TransUnion soon. Other programs are starting like app-based stuff. Experian Boost is the main one right now, but this is a way to like get credit on your credit report for stuff you're already doing. Um, same thing with like when you get that secured credit card, because, you know, for $200, 30% limit is just 60 bucks. That would be a great thing to just pay for a streaming service with. Pay for something you're already that's already in your budget and then just leave the card at home. You don't need to actually be spending on the credit card or buying, you know, anything on the credit card to be building credit. It's actually a lot easier and safer if you just put a bill on that credit card, automatic payments there, you can automatically pay it off. It's already built into your budget. And that's a great way to just let the credit build without you having to do anything. All right. So I know something with, when we talk about credit, some people might already be in over their heads. Um, so if you are concerned about debt or like managing your debt, maybe paying it down, the accelerated, that kind of stuff, like here's like just a little run through I like to talk about, which is like, can you minimize your expenses? What are some things you can sacrifice in the short term to really like have stability in the future? Uh, another thing we talked about, especially early in the pandemic, when lots of people were furloughed, is triaging your budget. Think about your needs versus your wants. Like, make sure you can pay those things you need to survive, like your house, your utilities, your car, um, like groceries, utilities, over, you know, more of the, the fun things in life. They are important, but can you, like, you know, triage your bu budget, uh, again, with the, like, short-term sacrifice thing? What can you cut back on now to maintain stability while you're getting through a furlough or an emergency, that sort of thing? That's what we talk about when triaging your budget. If, oh, if you are still desperate, uh, let's think about prioritizing your debts. Again, pay those secured debts over unsecured debts. You can also always like reach out to your lenders. If you are experiencing a hardship, like do that before you get really behind. Like if you, are experiencing job loss and you're like, oh no, I can't pay all my bills. Work through that budget. Think about the expenses you can minimize. Talk to your lenders, especially like your credit card companies, even your car loan and say, hey, can I go on some sort of hardship plan? Are there options for me to make it work for the next couple months while I'm trying to, you know, figure out this unexpected thing? Also, <laughs> the FEC can help you. Like, you can schedule a free counseling session uh, to get a better idea of um, what debt you have and what your best options are moving forward. And also like have an accountability partner as you work on, you know, minimizing those expenses because that is a big challenge for lots of people. All right. And so this is just like a little run through of, again, how you raise your credit score. Key thing, that 35%, make those on-time payments. Um, and then 30% rule, you know, keep your utilization under 30% and it counts for 30% of your score. Um, don't, don't look credit hungry and apply for too many accounts uh, in a short period. Um, and then this is another kind of a, like a nice little tip, like don't close an unused credit card um, like too soon, because if you close them, that will affect the, the length of time of your credit history. The one caveat I would add here is it is okay to close an unused credit card if it has an annual fee and you're not getting any benefit from it. So like if you have an airline miles card you're not using anymore and you're kind of afraid to close it, but you're paying $100 a year, I would say it would be worth having that $100 in your pocket versus, you know, having your credit score dip a little bit. That's something to think about. So 
Another thing, if you, maybe you get a secured credit card that has an annual fee and you can't get out of that annual fee, it might be worth you know, opening an unsecured credit card without an annual fee and closing that older secured card. Even if it is technically your oldest account, weigh those pros and cons. Like, is that 30 bucks worth it? Or can I keep that 30 bucks in my pocket? Those sorts of things. Um, also, if it's not used, the, the credit card company will probably close it after like two years of lack of use. But at that point, it's not actually helping your credit that much anymore because it hasn't been used for so long. So when the card company closes it, Yes, your score will dip a little bit, but it won't be as significantly as if you just paid it off and closed it right away. Cause that's, that looks a little like just not great from the credit scoring side. And then, um, yeah, always like check your free annual credit report for errors uh, and do that yearly just to make sure, you know, identity theft is unfortunately rampant. Let's just make sure everything is good, especially if you are working towards a big purchase, uh, you wanna do that well in advance so you can make sure anything gets cleared up with a, with a nice uh, period of time, which is why it's important to do it yearly. All right, well, that's a brief rundown of credit. Any questions? And Devon, what was the question you had? I'm curious. Um, the question was about uh, building your children's credit um, mm -hmm. and a safe way to do it and um, uh, how to do it. But you answered it before I could even ask. And so <laughs> I was excited about that. Yeah. And you can also, this is something I actually um, learned in a presentation last month or in the last couple of months, what is time anymore? Um, you can actually put a free security freeze on your children's credit um, now. And that's something good because, you know, their um, social security number might have been stolen and something might be happening that you don't even know about. And so it might be worth just putting a security freeze on your kid's credit okay. um, to make sure nothing happens. So that's something you can do through Experian. It's free. Um, I believe you have to renew it yearly, um, but that's just a good practice because unfortunately, like I said, especially with everything being on the internet, data being sold, uh, you know, identities are stolen all the time. So you might as well manage it and protect your kids so they don't have to deal with like this headache when they're 18 and yeah. trying to yeah. get an apartment. <laughs> so. That's great information. Thank you. Um, I never even heard of a security freeze before. So thank you. Yeah, they're, um, and I think they used to like have a cost associated with them, but now they're free. Um, it's annoying. They're like, we're gonna put a like put a paywall up for you protecting your own data, which is kind of insane because it's like, well, it's mine to begin with. Um, so I'm glad it's free now. <laughs> but you know, that's like more of a ethics question. <laughs> but yeah, any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, that security freeze was very good. My daughter just turned 18. Um, so she was just asking me about credit and all that good stuff. I'm I'm not gonna tell I'm gonna tell the truth. When I was young, I was a hot mess with uh, <laughs> credit cards. That's like yep. when I went off to college and they were just all on the campuses and yes. I understand that, but yeah, I'm, you know, trying to educate them a little bit more, but mm -hmm. Um, when they go to school, like she'll be going to college, if she gets um, student loans, does that appear on her credit report now or only after she graduates and begins to pay them? So that's kind of a, a double-edged question. So they will, I believe, appear on her credit report when she's in school, but most people don't pay on their student loans when they're in school because they're in the in-school deferment. So They'll be on her credit report, but they won't actually be helping her build credit Okay. while she's not paying on them because she's technically in a deferment. So it okay. will be on there and will help her credit, you know, when she starts paying on them after graduation, but it might also be worth to show something a little more active, maybe encouraging her to get like a secured credit card or have her be an authorized user on your cards or the like. Um, 
I will say I was also a hot mess, um, but it was after college for me. I just should have known better. I was 25. Um, and I'm paying thousands of dollars in credit card interest right now when I'm like, mm, really don't want to like, that's something I wish I could have avoided. Like, huh, I wish the FEC had existed when I was younger and they would have just told me like, don't do that. And I just listened to my mom when she was like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, youth is wasted on the young. Um, but you can, yeah, kind of, I really like the idea, especially with that secured credit card. Like, especially if you're someone who, you know, is tempted to spend, um, put some sort of automatic bill on it. Sometimes if you put your cell phone bill on a credit card, you get free cell phone insurance. It might not be great insurance, but it's free. Um, and you really don't want to use insurance. Anyways, you just want it as an insurance policy. Um, and just automate that. Automate the credit card pays your phone bill. You automate paying off the phone bill. And then you can just like leave the card in a drawer at home. Don't even have to take it with you. Avoid temptation completely. Um, I had to go when I was in my... the the depths of my credit card spending thing, I had to cut up my credit cards and like reassess my life. And it was a big like, okay, I don't wanna be here. So I think these are like nice tips to tell people in the future, like, yeah, spending on credit, it's a great payment uh, strategy. Like, you know, if you have an emergency and the bank isn't open and you need to pay $500 for a tow truck driver or something, that's when you want a credit card but you don't wanna use it as a loan. You wanna pay that off with an emergency fund. So really what you wanna do is leverage credit and savings. Like credit, great payment strategy. It's nice to not have to carry around cash or have cash at home, be able to pay in the moment and have it be really safe and secure. Like if you have a fraudulent charge on your credit card, the credit card companies are usually really easy to work with and you don't have to worry about your debit card and your checking account getting overdrafted. That's where credit cards are really nice. They're really good as a payment strategy, but too many of us, myself included, use it as a borrowing device alone. We don't want that. That's what you really want. You want the credit card to pay for the to pay for the emergency in the moment and then you pay it off with emergency savings. Or if you're going on like a trip overseas, like if your daughter does study abroad or something, like maybe she can have a credit card to pay for things overseas because you know her bank account is based in the US, but she should save up money for that trip and use that money to pay off the credit card. Um, but you, again, you kind of want to use the credit card smartly by not carrying that balance, but having it as a payment strategy, but having that money to pay it off in a bank account. Thank you. Good tips, good information. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's all for me, like, living and learning. <laughs> regrets. Lots of regrets. <laughs> and that's why I'm like, young people, don't do this. Don't be like me. <laughs> oh, yes, I understand. I try to tell them or steer them or guide them, you know, please don't make the same mistakes I, I did. But you live and you learn, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> right. And yeah, and that's why sometimes like I just was like not in the place to listen to my mom when I was in my mid 20s because I was like, sure, mom, whatever. She also told me to like save my raises and I was like, whatever, I'll be fine. I was like, no, I should have totally saved. My raises. <laughs> uh, so sometimes it's nice to get it from a stranger too, like have someone like, oh, you're saying the same thing my mom said. Maybe I should listen to her. And you're like, yes, <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good questions. And obviously I can talk about this a lot. But I think all of us at the FEC can. <laughs> Great. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, awesome. Um, thank you all so much, Alicia. Thank you so much for the in-depth conversation and answering all of those um, really great questions. Thank you to everyone for asking those really great questions. Um, I think it's also awesome when people who provide services are able to admit like, we're human and listen, like I also was a mess going through college and I definitely had to ask family members to help bail me out of it. And yes, you look mm -hmm. back and you're like, what was I even thinking? What was money then? But now we know. Um, yeah. yeah.
Yeah, so we're we're all human and we're going through this together. I know I have looked at uh, the registration form to sign up for appointments at the FEC. So um, we're all in this together for that. So I do also want to um, bring notice to, I did post um, a little survey in the chat and I'll also post it on uh, Facebook for people who are watching live stream at home. Um, for anyone that's watched any of our um, FEC series, um, if you could please fill out that survey, we are doing a raffle for a $25 gift card. So so um, if you fill that out, we can put you in the raffle for that. Um, that just lets us know, you know, hey, what did you learn from doing this series? And is, is this something that was helpful for you? Um, Alicia, thank you so much for posting your contact information. We will yeah. also send that back out. Um, we definitely encourage everyone to access this free free service. I uh, can't emphasize that enough. Um, I also quickly want to do uh, a little shameless plug about um, our next upcoming workshops and then also about voting. Um, so uh, next week we do have our chill sessions, um, which we're really excited about. And that's focused on um, Black mental wellness in the Hazelwood community. So you can reach out to Devon if you are interested in attending those. Um, a little wave, Devon. Hey, so um, you can reach out to her for those. Um, those uh, We do provide gift cards for the individuals that attend for that. And we do um, offer child care, but you have to be able to RSVP in advance. Um, actually, the RSVP for the child care um, needs to be done. I believe it's before Monday. Is that correct, Yvonne? Actually, today. Today. But, uh, yes, it was today. <laughs> this is why but, I have to uh, if you get to me tomorrow, it'll be okay too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we want to let our, our person that's um, offering that child care know in advance. Um, the following week, we will also be hosting the um, Pitt School of Nursing. They're going to be talking about careers in the medical field. Um, November uh, 19th, I believe it is that Wednesday after that, or it's the 17th. November 17th, um, we are going to be doing Health Insurance 101. Um, so you can join us and uh, learn from Penny representatives. So Penny is PA system to be able to sign up for um, health insurance um, through the government. So learn how to access uh, that platform. And um, what does all of that language mean? Sort of just like demystifying credit, like what do all of those words really mean in terms of health insurance? I will be learning a lot from those. I still don't know. Again, you know, we are human, we don't know. Um, and then I also want to bring um, notice to that next week is for voting. So next Tuesday is the day to vote. Um, local elections matter. Uh, the Board of Elections is predicting that maybe 20% of our population in Allegheny County is going to show up to the polls. So do you really want your life ruled out by the 20% of the population? You know, your, vo your voice and your vote matters, especially in local elections. It comes down to just a few couple of votes to be able to get those things. I know that um, in the last election, people, um, they're like, well, I already voted for the mayor and I already voted for my school board rep, especially if you live in Hazelwood. We have to vote for those people again. That could change over, right? Especially for our school board reps, we want to look at that, especially for our mayor. It's the same candidates that are up again for that. So you want to look at that. Um, and then also judges, right? If you or someone that you love has been impacted by the judicial system, um, you know how important it is to have fair uh, judges. So we have, I believe it's 10 seats open um, locally. So you really want to pay attention to that um, and be able to get out there and vote for those things. You can find more resources at votes.pa.gov. Um, you can also uh, see what your ballot actually is going to look like on Ballotpedia or Vote411. Um, if you need any more information about that, please feel free free to um, hit Devon and I up. Um, but that is my shameless plug about all of the amazing things that are happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, Alicia, thank you again so much for joining us. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone else that's been watching for joining us as well. All right. Yes, thanks great Alicia. Just to be with you. Yeah. Thanks Devon. Thank you, Alicia. I think I might come to that healthcare one too, because yes. yeah. Yeah. it's a very, it's a confusing thing for sure. And we'll I think send you out the information. Just pop in, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Obviously a cat fan. So <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so for the much. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank Bye. you. Good night. Good night.